It's my pleasure to welcome Stephen Kotler back to the show. He was on before talking mostly about his abundance book that he wrote with Peter Diamandis. And he is, of course, founder of the Flow Research Collective, one of the world's leading experts on the ultimate human performance and number one New York Times bestselling author of Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. He's the author of 14 books, so I won't have time to mention them all. But I have read, of course, Abundance. I've read The Rise of Superman, which is about decoding the science of ultimate human performance and a bold that he did with Peter Diamandis, How to Go Big, Create Wealth and Impact the World. And really looking forward to hearing today about the future is faster than you think about converging technologies that are transforming business industries and our lives and his newest book the art of the impossible a peak performance primer Stephen, welcome back how are you i am well jason thanks for having me it's great to have you back and you're coming to us from northern nevada and you must just spend a ton of time writing because you just turn out a, just a huge body of work I love writing. I mean, I love yeah. what I do. Like I wake every day, it starts at four o'clock in the morning and I write till 8 a.m. no matter what. And then often I'll write, you know, other chunks of the day. But like, you know, I like to uh, jokingly, but it's true. I've seen the sunrise every day for 30 years. Wow. Um, yeah. because, because of my, right, I get up at four o'clock in the morning, you start writing it. You know, it's a habit of getting up that early. One, I'm an action sport athlete. So if you're surfing, you want to be in the waves by like 7 a.m. for dawn patrol. So you have to write ahead of time, whatever, but it just stuck with me. And uh, yeah. yeah, if and yeah. You, you know, you write that much, you're going to produce that much. And I also, yeah. I, I came up in an era of like the, my cohorts who were journalists with me at the same time, Michael Lewis, Malcolm Level, were productive. It's a, mm -hmm. It was a productive generation of writers, I think. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Well, talk to us a little bit about The Future is Faster Than You Think. I'd like to start with that one, and then we'll Perfect. get to your newest book, Art of the Impossible. In reading Abundance years ago, there's so much pessimism out there, but really, it feels like if you're looking at that graph, right, you know, that we're at a hockey stick inflection point with technology would that be fair to say or is that too yeah, optimistic? yeah i mean no i mean well it's not optimistic meaning it's true it's not at you guys i mean you're talking about an exponential growth curve and abundance was about the fact that there are 11 at that point 11 technologies all advancing on exponential growth curves and that these technologies give us the ability to for the first time ever to tackle kind of global grand challenges poverty energy shortages healthcare crises and you know that sort of stuff um bold was a how-to essentially how do you take these ideas use them in the world how do you build companies around that, these hockey stick technologies the new book the future is faster than you think what's different what's like what happened is as you'll remember from abundance we're really talking about like individual exponential technologies right there's a chapter on you know energy and it's mostly about solar and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a chapter on robotics and but what's happening now is these formerly independent lines of exponential technologies that are all accelerating wildly they're starting to converge overlap and what you get is a whole is much greater than the sum of its parts effects so now this is not optimism this is what i say this is the fact then we'll come back to where the optimism is going to come into play the fact is and ray kurzweil who's sort of the the smartest guy in the room on exponential technology and has been for a while his predictions are very accurate he has said we are going to experience roughly 20,000 years worth of technological change by the end of the 20th century, 21st century. This means we're going birth of agriculture to the industrial revolution twice in the next 80 years. What it means is in the next 10 years, we're going to experience about 100 years worth of technological change. So if you think back to 1921, fast forward to now, think about all the technological change that's happened, you can pack that into about 10 years. That's Ray's prediction, that's what's happening with converging technology. That's what we're seeing. So what Peter and I did was we said, okay, if this is happening, let's go through every, all 11 of the major industries on earth, the biggest industries in the world, and let's plot what's going to happen over the next decade. Where, mm -hmm. like, the optimism is more wealth is going to be created over the next 10 years than possibly has in the whole history of humanity. The opportunity is amazing. That said, if you are a legacy organization and you're trying to hold on to what was, you've got a big problem, right? Yeah. Like, so 
That's why I pause when you said opt. It's very optimistic because we're wired that way. But if you're not embracing the idea that we have to learn to move very fast to keep pace with today's world, that's where it's pessimistic. Yeah, right. Good, good points. So I want to make sure that I ask you how you think that wealth that's coming that will be created will be distributed will it be you know very concentrated at the top will it be widely dispersed and i certainly don't want central planners to distribute the wealth i'm just saying by nature of the economy but so, but i want to make sure also i ask you for some examples of these convergences because that is yeah let me I, well let me give you a great one because it's, it's sort of we open the book with flying cars and flying cars People have been fantasizing about flying cars for literally like 4,000 years. There's like, you can go back to ancient Hindu texts and they talk about flying chariots, right? Like this is an old fantasy. There are now a hundred different flying car companies. In fact, the battery technology breakthrough that we've been waiting for to unlock all of them, show, I saw the news release of it yesterday. So the point is that why did it take so goddamn long to get a flying car? Like, what's the deal? Flying cars are flying robots, right? Essentially, they're AI controlled. So AI meets robotics inside the flying car because you can't fly a flying car um, that way. They have all kinds of radical new materials because they have to be durable enough for travel, yet light enough for lift. They have cutting edge battery technology that is a spinoff of the solar industry that allows for kind of the energy density and the lightweight that you need for a flying car. And I could go on and on. There are about 11 different kind of technologies that all come together in flying cars. Okay. So That's I could, I could see there that we've, you know, we've got to have the computer technology needs to be fast at processing. It needs to have an AI add on maybe needs to be self-driving the whole thing needs to be maybe made out of graphene or some, you know, very high strength, low weight product. So yeah, there's a lot of convergence there, right? Yeah. Here's the point. It's not just flying cars. We're also getting in the same decade, Hyperloop. These are maglev trains, 700 miles an hour, Los Angeles to Las Vegas in 20 minutes. There are 25 different Hyperloop projects in the globe right now. Elon Musk wants to repurpose his rockets that are going to get us to Mars in the 2030s for terrestrial space travel, electric cars, I can go on. The point is that all of these things are converging on transportation and this is gonna have huge effects. The difference between abundance and now is an abundance, we would have a single exponential and it's gonna disrupt, disrupt products and create opportunity, like new products, new services, new markets. And when With, you say abundance, you mean the book abundance? The book abundance, yeah. yeah. 2013, when we were talking about single exponentials, or 2011, I think, single exponentials, the opportunity was, oh, let's start a robotics company. Oh, let's start an AI company, right? Now the opportunities are at the center of, you know, six, seven, eight different exponentials and so you're getting and it's not just the level of disruption has increased so it's no longer just products services and markets it's now institutions or really kind of foundational fabric of society stuff like if you live in los angeles and you can now go to las vegas in 25 minutes which will be where will be by 2028 or so how big is the local dating pool how big is the local school district where do you do your banking where do you do your shopping right? Like really simple, basic, how we organize our lives suddenly really changes, really yeah. expands. Right. You know, Stephen, one of the things I often say is geography is less meaningful than it's ever been in human history. I think that's smart. Yeah, yeah. Be yeah. Because, you know, when I say that I'm talking about the self-driving car coming and I'm talking about teleconferencing technology, right? It's still meaningful when it comes to the three or four blocks around your house. But once you get past that, that walkable area, it doesn't much matter. Yeah, it's really interesting. And COVID has even expanded on that or accelerated that idea even more. Yeah, I um, think so too. Can you give us maybe just another example of the convergence that is going to Yeah, I mean, I'll give you, so let me give you the one that I, when Peter and I started talking about this a while ago, but the thing I noticed that brought it to my attention, I was like, okay, this is interesting. I work at the Flow Research Collective on our board as a man named Adam Ghazali. Adam's a neuroscientist at UCSF, and he created a video game 
that treats cognitive decline in older adults. Basically, cognitive decline is about six different things that decline. He has found a way to reset two of them, basically to where you are in 2020, put it into a video game. This video game, he made it, this was on the cover of Nature four years ago, but it was approved by the FDA last year. So you can now go to the doctor and get a script for go home and play this video game a couple hours a day. So a couple of years ago, I was giving a big talk to all the executives at NBC and they wanted to know what the future of convergent technologies look like. And I told them about Adam's game. I said, look, you don't understand. Right now, you think entertainment and healthcare are totally unrelated fields, and they are. But 10 years from now, are you going to the movies? Or are you going to go to the movies that makes you smarter or hmm. treats cognitive decline or is yeah. neuroprotective or play video game? And that's where this is going. And so that's, a, that's an example of a mashup market, right? Interesting. Very interesting. Which, by the way, leads me to a question for you about Neuralink. Are we... Getting close to that, you know, Musk demonstrated it on pigs several yeah, months ago. And... So I, um, I think the Neuralink work is amazing. I, so I've been following where it started at Harvard and where it's going. And I will tell you as a guy who works in neuroscience and works with a lot of, of the top neuroscientists in America, I don't know anyone, myself included, who hears his timetables and his predictions and thinks they're real. I think there, I think his technology is real and the development curve is at, like, it's there. Well, and, he's famous for missing deadlines. Yeah, we all know but that's, that. <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, I think his deadlines for this shit are off by a decade, if not more. But yeah, the technology is real and it's progressing. I also think there are going to be, as we start to scale this up into humans, you want to interface with the inner, like everything that consciousness does, everything the brain does is it tries to filter out reality. We mm -hmm. take 11 million inputs a second coming to our senses. Senses consciousness is 2000 bits. And what you can actually pay attention to is under 300. So everything in our filter screen is in our brain is designed to filter out massive amounts of information. So I don't give a shit if Elon can hook my brain up to the cloud because he still hasn't dealt with the filter problem. Okay, so it's how fast we can receive and process the information. I mean, we can think faster than we can listen. The typical speaker talks at, you know, 200 words a minute or something. We can process 600 words a minute or something like that, I've heard. But the neural link can't get it into us fast enough. How do you That's get, point, how, right? I mean, my point is, right, I have the World Wide Web on my phone. Do I need it in my head? because there's the same biology that sits between my phone and me, which is I've got all these filters that process out external information. Otherwise, would be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff we'd be flooded. We'd, what would you pay attention to? Right. What's important, what's not important? These same, all these issues exist. I know this so well because flow is the only time you can actually turn up the amount of information coming in through the brain that we can process. Flow amplifies all kinds, all the, all the kind of foundational information processing structures in the brain. So I'm well aware of like, what are the bottlenecks? And it's not just me. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi in his book, Flow, in 1990. Right, which I read years and years yeah, ago. He yeah. wrote about this bottleneck in 1990 mm -hmm. um, in that book. And other people have written about it since. So I like there are things like that where I think, okay, the thing you're talking about is kind of real. But it, like I, I'm not saying this is, these are unsolvable. I'm just saying these are, these are puzzles. These are what we're going to have to come to next. And I don't think... His timetable is accurate. I think okay. I think we'll get there. Sure. I just think the timetable is crazy. The distribution of the wealth. Ah, the, there okay. will be a lot of wealth created with these new technologies and the convergence of them, just huge amounts of new wealth. How will it be distributed? So that's an interesting question. A few big tech companies? <laughs> no, I've, not at all. So we've made this really clear in bold and abundance, and we reiterate it again in faster. Exponential technologies follow a six, we call it the six Ds of exponentials, right? It's a very, very well-established by now development cycle. And they start out, they're deceptive. They're small, you know, they're weird. Then they're disruptive. The last three are dematerialized, demonetized, and democratized. So, right, your my smartphone has a million and a half dollars worth of 1980s technology in it for free that technology has been demonetized. 
right? I don't have to go out and buy an iPod anymore. I don't have to go out and buy a camera or a video camera, blah, blah, blah. And it's, and like, it's democratized because everybody has one. Everybody has one, right? right? Yeah. So this is this this happens with all these trends. So what you get with your money and what you start to get for free, like that is just like what's available to us from a goods and service perspective is going to continue to increase. 3D printers, democratize stuff. We're getting 3D printed houses and et cetera, et cetera. So all that is still coming. All that is still happening. I do when I look at like clearly there is a huge, right? There's a huge concentration of wealth right now. And some of that is 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 legacy money. Right, it's family money, it's generational. But the new wealth, the difference is not, it's not a rich, it's a digital, non-digital. And it's really about companies. It's not about individuals anymore. It's whole industries that haven't wanted to digitize, haven't wanted to step into the 21st century. And if you work in a non-digital industry, you are suffering right now, without mm -hmm. a doubt. If you work in a digital industry, you're not suffering. There's no wealth divide at all. The opportunities are amazing. There is a digital, non-digital, and it's not even about like personal technology anymore. It's about the actual kind of, the, so this, that will all really start to shift over the next 10 years because you're not going to be able to compete non-digital. So I think that's going to start to, I hope that's going to start to shrink. You know, I think we'll start to see another generation of tech companies where you know there's concentrated power because there'll always be a new industry and there will always be an industry leader right and the vr version of google is it going to be google or is it going to be some vr ar version of google that you know go, you know that search that takes yeah. over well certainly facebook buying oculus years ago right. they're making big inroads and they they might be the first to make it you know widely used so that's interesting but you know certainly these big tech companies are in my opinion abusing their power dramatically it's really especially lately but that's a another subject oh, i think it's absurd yeah. i mean i yeah. think it's absurd yeah okay yeah i mean by the way the fact that apple glad you agree <laughs> well the fact that, i mean like, i love apple i've been a mac fan since the beginning of time literally i've owned every computer they've ever made and yet I was looking at the My new, love for them has waned a lot recently. They, they keep changing. Every time they put out a new phone, it has entirely new peripherals. So you have they're, to buy They're greedy. In. They're just, yeah, they're, they're just they're, money I agree scams. with you. Yeah. I agree with you. That's my problem now is like, that's you're bad for the environment and you're scamming me. And they're terrible for the environment. They're outrageously expensive. And you know what? Frankly, the other products have caught up quite a bit, you know? I mean, that Microsoft Surface is a pretty awesome product, but I got my more than enough complaints about Microsoft and Bill Gates too, but you know, that's another discussion. I mean, look, at nothing's perfect. It's just that this democratized angle, it, it would be really nice to see it kind of stay that way and go that way. But, but the, the leverage in tech is so massive that it's this winner take all type of, of world, you know, it's, it's just sort of the way capital formation works in this country. I don't think we're going to change that, but if you have a comment on that, great, but let's, let's switch gears to talk about your new book, because you really mentioned a good thing about flow, allowing the information to come into you faster and how that state, but if you have a comment about the capital formation, feel free. No, 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 no. Let's jump to flow. I don't, right. I, I don't at all. That's not so, my expertise. So the art of the impossible. <laughs> It's a peak performance primer and sort of like, let's start, but what the hell do I mean by peak performance, right? Let's just start there. Sure. Um, and then we'll go into what the book is about. When I say peak performance, I'm not, I don't mean anything other than getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. Mm -hmm. That biology, especially if you're talking about businesses, a business wealth podcast, cognitive peak performance, instead of physical skills, mental skills, that is essentially a set of skills that move files under the heading of motivation, there's another set of skills under the heading of learning. There's another set of skills under the head of, heading of creativity. And then finally, flow. Flow is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and perform our best. More specifically, it refers to any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption that's so focused on the task at hand, so focused on what you're doing that everything else just seems to disappear and all aspects of performance tend to go through the roof. 
that's the entire suite of cognitive peak performance, meaning. And, and, you know, and we've all felt that at one time or another, probably that we've been in a state of flow where things just work. They just happen. If you haven't read the rise of Superman, which, which is, you know, a, a great exposure to this, uh, Stephen's uh, prior book, you know, we, most of us have felt that state at one time or another to one degree or another. Some people, well, I mean, you got, so in it. for it's universal, every, all it's, it, we, when I say all human beings are hardwired for peak performance, what I mean is flow is universal in humans and show it's actually universal in most mammals and all social mammals, including mm -hmm. humans. Um, we all can get into flow. Uh, the amplification is motivation, productivity, and grit are amplified about 500% above baseline. Learning is accelerated. This is work done by the US Department of Defense. Soldiers in flow learn 250 to 500% faster than normal. Creativity and innovation spike 400 to 700%. Collaboration, cooperation, communication, and empathy. Why do you care about these skills? I've literally just listed off every single skill that experts agree you need to thrive in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's the like, and flow amplifies all of them significantly. But there's more to peak performance than just flow. I've written a bunch of books on flow. What I haven't done is taken the hard neurobiological research that we do at the Flow Research Collective on the science of peak performance and put it into a, a how-to primer. This is, you know, start to finish, how to apply the tools of cognitive peak performance to taking on high hard challenges what i call you know in the book is essentially lessons learned from people who have done capital i impossible that which we thought could never be done and this is in all domains sports science technology culture etc um but it's meant to be applied by anybody who's interested in what i call lowercase i impossible which those things we think are impossible for ourselves i grew up in cleveland ohio i wanted to be a writer from the time i was five or six years old it was a blue collar steel mill town i didn't know any writers I didn't know how you became a writer there was no books there was no internet there was no one to ask it was a small eye impossible sure right arriving out of poverty small eye impossible becoming a successful entrepreneur or another small eye impossible becoming world class at anything that you do so um and because peak performance is nothing more than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us the toolkit is the same. If you want to go after capital I impossible, great. It's the suite of tools that start with motivation, go through flow, small I impossible, same thing. And if you just, if you're listening to me and you're like, dude, forget about small I impossible, capital I impossible. I just like want Monday to be a little bit better and easier and a little more productive. And I want to get along better with my kids kind of thing. Well, right. it turns out the biology is the same. So that's what the art of impossible is about. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of these steps? I mean, this is, this is a, like a more practical, tactical book, right? Extremely practical. Enough. Yeah. W what are some of the steps we can all use to get into that flow state and take advantage of increased productivity? So there's a sequence. Our biology was designed in a certain order, in a certain way. The sequence starts with motivation, goes through learning, goes through creativity, ends on flow. But if so, and you have to train up all these skills at the same time, flow states, if you would like more flow in your life, one of the things we know is flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. I won't go into too much detail from a neurobiological standpoint, but flow follows focus. It shows up when all of our attention is focused in the right here, right now. That's what these 22 triggers do. They drive our attention to the present moment. So if you want more flow in your life, these triggers are your toolkit. Now, there's no simple way to train these things, right? That's why at the Flare Research Collective, we have an eight-week training called Zero to Dangerous that we use to train people in this stuff. But I can tell you, um, and we, if, you're, if you're interested, we, we send you through it with a PhD neuroscientist or psychologist as your coach. Um, it's a thick, it's a lot of work, but... Mm -hmm. um, we measure flow pre and post with the standard psychological instruments, the same ones that Mihai Jik Seven Mihai developed, and we see a 70 to 80 percent increase in flow. So it's very trainable. Um, the thing why you care about motivation, learning, and creativity, these other things that are also amplified by flow, flow is very trainable, and you can actually massively increase the amount of flow in your life. It's not stable, right? I can get a huge jump. I can teach you these tools, teach you how they work, and you can go out and apply them tomorrow, and you'll get a huge jump in the amount of flow in your life but you can't sustain it over long periods of time unless you sort of, you have to learn to amplify that everything that flow amplifies, you also have to learn to kind of work with. It's like a, it's like, think of a, a Model T, you take a Model T, I can soup up the engine, put in a turbo booster and go 200 miles an hour. But if it's still got those shitty skinny tires, it's yeah. going to explode sooner or later. Right. Same thing. Yeah.
Okay. So can we, or would we want to be in a state of flow all the time? Or is that just inappropriate to even want that? Is, would that be unhealthy? Well, or so would, let, would we always just, want to be? Yeah, let, let, yeah. Let, so let me, let's just start with, we have a term in the industry for, for uh, being in flow all the time. We call that mania, sometimes mm -hmm. schizophrenia. <laughs> so yeah, you can't actually live in flow. There's no such thing. And like, and there's a bunch of like the new age community loves to say, oh, I want to live in flow. That's enlightenment. And no, actually you're totally wrong. Flow it's is Nirvana. a four stage cycle. <laughs> There, yeah, there's neurobi there's different neurobiological changes underneath each stage. You have to move through the whole cycle to reboot into flow. And no, you don't want to live in a permanent flow state. Flow is phenomenal for a ton of stuff. But you know what turned off in flow? Mm -hmm. Long-term planning. Risk-taking goes way up. Long-term planning is oh, turned man. way off. And uh, on top of that, um, your sense of morality and your sense of uh, uh, is also turned off. Flow's ethically neutral, right? But I always like to point out that cat burglars are in flow. In fact, I just read a phenomenal uh, paper by Csikszentmihalyi that I'd never seen before from like the 90s, early 90s on flow in school crime. <laughs> so <clears throat> flow is, it's neutral. It could be used for good or for ill. If you go back to the 50s, the literature on flow is all about war. It was soldiers in flow. So depending on how you're feeling is on, you know, the military industrial complex, you know what I mean? So you don't want to be there all the time. And I, and, and, and for those reasons, like I, you know, there's a thing, a lot of marketers, a lot of the new age people, a lot of the self-help gurus, they like to kind of put their customers into flow and sell them shit. That's like, let me, let me put you into an ultimate state of consciousness and upsell you. This is a standard right. self-help tactic. And I always say this is the most <laughs> ethically dubious thing in the world. Cause you're literally putting people into a state of consciousness where risk taking is turned way up. They're euphoric and they've got no long-term planning. Right. Mm -hmm. Are you making good financial decisions when that's going on? You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So, I, you know, I, I remember when I was a little kid, I went to this and my mom is an antique collector and I went to this expensive antique auction in L.A. where we lived. And I met Barbara Streisand, who was there when I was a little kid. And and it, it was interesting because it was unheard of at the time to have this big bar at the antique auction and it included free unlimited drinks. And so all the adults were like drinking and bidding, you know, so their financial decisions were, <laughs> yeah. he, he got people into a different kind of yeah, flow. No, I mean, it's just, but it's the same, yeah. it's the same problem, it's dopamine. I mean, it flows worse because it shuts off the prefrontal cortex, but right. booze will downregulate the prefrontal cortex as well. So actually, yeah, I don't know which is worse. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, interesting. And that's why, you know, people in sexually excited stages, they take huge risk and make terrible decisions, right? So, you know, we don't Same need thing. to talk about yeah. that. But, you know, yeah, I think everybody gets it. Can you connect this with another book of yours that I really enjoyed that I also read called Stealing Fire? And that's... Um, uh, about, uh, about, you know, this peak state, I, is that the same as flow or is that flow being introduced by outside? So stealing fire, there's a suite of human experiences that all are north of happy. Okay. So flow states are up there, trance states, ecstatic states, out of body experiences. Like we understand neurobiologically what causes all these things, dreams. These are all north of happy altered states experiences. They share psychedelic states as well, they share similar overlapping neurobiological mechanisms. So flow, when, when we define flow neurobiologically there's, and physiologically, there's 11 different markers or 12 different markers, 13 different markers, depending on what you're calculating, that we will look for to say, ah, oh, this is flow. There's overlap. Psychedelics share six of those markers. Meditative states share nine of those markers, 10 of those markers. So the point that we were making is, hey, since the enlightenment, we've been sort of rational materialism has kind of ruled the roost. And we've had a very rational skills-based approach to mastery to progress, things like that. The skills we want in the 21st century, creativity, innovation, cooperation, collaboration, these are actually states of consciousness. When the brain wants you to be more cooperative and collaborative, it floods pro-social neurochemicals into your system and it turns up your pattern recognition skills. So you can notice more of what other people are doing and you're friendlier and more open to them. Yeah, remember names the, and faces even. Yeah, that's, it, that's yeah, really interesting. Right, and so we sh there's a whole bunch of 
things that aren't skills and you can't train them like skills. They're states of consciousness. Flow is an example, right? You have to shift your brain to shift states to drop into flow to unlock these skills. So where we are now kind of as a species is, oh, we've gotten really good at the skills acquisition side of this coin. Now we have to sort of like start working on the states. And that's sort of what we talked about in Stealing Fire. And Stealing Fire was really a look at like all the different places in society and culture, whether it was like the US Navy SEALs or Silicon Valley executives or wherever where they were harnessing altered states to improve performance and productivity. And that was Stealing Fire. So flow was a part of it. Um, but Stealing Fire was a slightly kind of bigger picture. And it was more of a, I think, a trend story than anything else. Yeah, very interesting. Your work is is just fantastic, Stephen. So thank you for that. Any things you want to say, question I didn't ask you, just whatever you want to leave the listeners with as we wrap up? Yeah, I, let me give them a gift. Because if you hear me talk about flow, and you're like, okay, I want more flow in my life. What can I do? Right? And I don't want to take one of his classes yet. Go to www.flowblocker.com. There are six, it's probably more, but there's six major well-diagnosed blockers of flow, things that stand between you and more flow. We built a diagnostic. So it's a free diagnostic. It's very well validated at this point. Tens of thousands of people have taken and gotten good results. It will tell you where you're at and then it'll email you a bunch of steps. And it's thick, it's robust. It's not like, it's not a skimpy marketing thing. It's a, hey, we built a serious diagnostic because we wanted to help people. And so that's out there. Okay, so at flowblocker.com, that's a three-minute quiz, right? Uh, it's about a 10-minute quiz, and I think, and um, yeah, and then you get a bunch of information on the back end that includes, you know, action steps and videos and things like that um, that you can take to get that out of your way. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today, and we appreciate that, and uh, thanks for helping us pay attention to flow and being in that state more often when we need to. Thanks, Jason. It was fun hanging out with you again. Good to see you.